Now to the concluding part of our symposium, the round table of editors, translators, and friends of artists. Um, as Barbara Held said, it was a family and friend affair. And uh, I think uh, editors and, and uh, translators were in a way part of the family and certainly friends. And we will have translators, um, uh, editors, and friends uh, at this round table. This session will be moderated by Fred Moody, editor-in-chief of Anvil Academic, a publisher of digitally mediated scholarly work. So I turn things over to Fred, and I ask all the, all the participants of the round table to um, take seats well, here. Mm -hmm. Very important thing I forgot to say, which is that none of us would be here if all the my one day hadn't had the idea of celebrating Cluster. So thank you. I don't want to sound too modest. <laughs> Everyone wants to, to be acknowledged, but it's the entire team of Greece. And I it's my privilege and to to be part of this team. Thank you, Alandea. kind of a lightning round um, <laughs> speaking engagement is uh, we kind of represent somewhat chronologically a little bit overlapping uh, the history of the press as seen from the engine room and each of us I think will we'll take a few minutes to talk about um, how we met Carl and came to work for artists and what we remember is kind of the the sort of the mission of artists at the time. There's kind of a, a narrative arc there, I think. Um, and I think, at least in my experience, how we came to work for artists really tells a lot about Carl's instinctive man of action, secret agent kind of persona that didn't really come across in public. And uh, so I think we'll just sort of share our own little memories of our time there. Uh, we'll try to be. We'll within the range of five minutes, and we'll see how it goes. So we'll start with Christine, who was really part of the founding of the journal and the enterprise and everything. Not only was I there at the very first day of artists, I was there the first day Carl walked into a classroom. And I also have the privilege, I think, of being the matchmaker between Carl and Ellen Dea. And and I'll tell you why. Alan Dea said women love... <laughs> oh, I blush. I would blush too much on camera. As Alan Dea said, women loved Carl. And I was no exception. I came from, you know, girls' schools and girls' college. And, oh, I fell in love with Carl. And he knew it. And he liked me too, but he, in a very nice Eugene Onegin moment, took me into his office and said, Christine, Christine, you are an innocent. And I love you and I will love you till I die, but I am not going to corrupt you because I will spoil you for every man who follows me. <laughs> His next breath was, can you introduce me to your friend Ellen Dea? <laughs> and that really, you know, so I, I, I you know, I, I take a lot of credit for this artist stuff. <laughs> so anyhow, the first day, it was, I, I got into a Gogol class. I, I, Gogol was, I was a math major. I read Dead Souls three times one weekend in my junior year, changed my major, and I said, 
this is it for me. And I came into Indiana and E.J. Brown, who was our chair then, said, you can't take an upper level class. You know, the freshmen, you know, I mean, the first year students have to take surveys. And I said, Gogol changed my life. And I have to take this proffer guy. So he said, well, you had some lit. I'll let you do it. All right. So it was really Gogol who brought Carl and me together. I walk in, we're sitting there, and there must have been about 40 of us in that class, and you know, most of them were all sitting, they're very, you know, the older generation of the graduate students who had been there probably about 20 years. And you know, and I walk in, and then all of a sudden, this was the pre-metamorphosis by Ellen Dea Curl. This very, very young man walks in, and what I mean, makeover. He was the six foot three. He had a most unfashionable crew cut with this droopy mustache, glasses that had frames that even nerds wouldn't wear, a loud sport coat and a red tie. And I thought to myself, who in the world is this jock? And why is he in front of the classroom? And then he spoke. And I was hooked. And I'm hooked to this very, very day. Carl formed a generation of Slavists, maybe even two. And I think everybody here is going to acknowledge it. But I would like to challenge all those who have their careers thanks to him also to come up someday and acknowledge it, because there are so many who don't who don't. Now, was he a tough grader? Oh, yes he was. But he taught me something good. He taught me not only how to correct papers very thoroughly, and were there snotty comments on it? Well, yeah. But he also had fabulously wonderful comments. And he wrote on, I remember I was the last person to get my paper back, and what did he do? He made us all write a, 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 a paper on Taras Bulba and the Iliad, and only after we handed our papers in did he say, ha, 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 I already published one. And, you know, and he had, he was given bad grades to these, you know, gray beards uh, of graduate students, and I was terrified. And, uh, yeah, I got an A, but you know, otherwise I wouldn't have been an artist, would I? And uh, but he wrote such wonderful stuff that I worked on air for weeks, years. When I feel bad, I still go back and I read it. But you know, the thing is, is that he made us work, and he made us be precise. And just everything Ellen Dea said, the basketball player and the scholar. You all knew him as the Wunderkind researcher. I knew him as probably the best professor I ever had in my life. And at one point, about a little year before he died, he looked at me and he said, oh God, Christine, I look at you and I wonder, what did I do to the world? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I created a monster because I was the ACDC, no, OCD or whatever it's called. I get those things mixed up. I once told my students I had ACDC and they just looked, whoa, too much information. So anyhow, I mean, he said I created this monster, but he did. But it was a Carl monster and it was a Gagolian monster and it was somebody who well, as you can see, lived with digressions. And my whole life is this life of digression. Yesterday, when Professor Delinen was talking about how remarkable all these subtexts were in Lolita, he made us do that. He made us read every single thing. We read uh, Overcoat. We had to read Bartleby the Scrivener. We read this. We had to, I had to read Maturin, the, the Wandering. We did this, we had to read everything. When I took Pushkin for him, he had that uh, the book up in front of us and he said, let's look for mistakes. Let's look for mistakes and send him a list. He, when we took, he, we did the Pushkin. He made us learn every, you know, Hysteron, Proteron, Syndetin, Polysyndetin, 
We knew it. We had to. He made us learn passages. We had to know how to identify Gogol out of everybody else. He made us into readers. He made us into writers. He made us into people who loved Russian. We got the Russian bug from Carl, and some of us have been infected to this day. Parody, yes. Was he funny in class? Yes. Skeptical? The student, not I. We weren't in this because them. Ellen Dea, Sidney Schultz, I, and Tom Burchinsky of late memory, I found out later we were known as the four horsemen of the golden age of the, uh, of the did you know that? The four horsemen we were called? Because they couldn't believe people who actually helped each other in graduate school. But he, um, <laughs> he had that skepticism and he said, okay, these are writers. These are writers, they're not idols. You do not make an idol. And he taught us every idol has a feet of clay. And in all my years working with Carl and Ellen Dea in Ann Arbor, in Russia, being, well, I met lots of idols and boy, I met a lot of big clay feet. And that's the one nice thing that Carl would never do is expose who had the clay feet. But he didn't treat them as idols, he tr treated them as writers. And it was writing, 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 writing. He was generous, he was kind, and let me put it this way. He was prepared. He never came to class not prepared. He took teaching as seriously as he took everything else. He was a teacher first. He was a professor. And you know the word professor means you have to profess something. And my God, he did. He professed it and he taught us to do the same. Now, I know this skepticism, there were a bunch of graduate students who wrote a parody of the Slavic department and Carl's name was Mr. Scoffer instead of Mr. Proffer. But I'll tell you how I found out much later how much he prepared for classes and how much he, then we knew how much he did the same in every single thing he took up. He gave me generously all of the notes his teaching notes for all of his classes. He let me Xerox them. He, you know, you start out, you don't have any self-confidence, blah, blah, blah. And I'll finish as soon because I know everybody else wants to talk about Carl too. When I saw the notes he took, and I can attest to this, we did it right before we came, his notes on Chekhov alone weighed three pounds, six and a half ounces on my kitchen scale. Gogol was more. Pushkin was more in romanticism, <laughs> the scale couldn't hold it. This, he prepared everything. He knew everything that needed to know. If you needed to know it, he knew it. And so what I'm saying is, if it hadn't been for Carl, I wouldn't have had a life. Honestly, he took me out of this, you know, schoolgirl and turned me into something he made my life different. But I have to tell you one thing, and I'll end with this. All of his students, that he, the ones he worked with, had good careers. But there was one person in our cohort who had never, never had a course from Carl. And she outshone us all. She wasn't his protege. She wasn't his mentee, she was his full partner. And Ellen Dea needs the same amount of credit because yes, without Ellen Dea there would have been an artist, but only with that synergistic combo of Carl and Ellen Dea did we get this monument to Russian culture. Ellen Dea. I talked too long, but I'm sorry. Yeah, that's great. Go Bill. <laughs> um, I met Carl in Ohio in 1970 and in July 71 I moved to Ann Arbor. For the first few days at Getty's Lake Townhouses I slept in bunk beds along with his sons Andrew, Christopher and Ian. And, and, and I was soon to play a crucial role in Carl's life and art as publishers. 
teenage brother-in-law. <laughs> True, I knew nothing about Russian literature, but I was willing to learn and a hard worker. Since the manuscripts were not going to typeset themselves, someone had to do some work. In the early years of artists, Carl, Ellen Day, and I wrangled with the IBM Selectric Composer. This was a strike-on typesetting machine used to produce all artist publications before 1975. Wikipedia skips over any mention of this machine and the artist records article simply says, Carl learned that by using a composer, he could quickly produce printed text. Sounds effortless, doesn't it? <laughs> Every line in a book or Russian literature tri-quarterly had to be typed in twice, once to measure the words that would fit into a line with, and a second time to justify them, spacing the words so they were flush at the right margin. This gave you a finished square block of type that said professional versus the ragged edge produced by a typewriter. To make things more complicated and stressful, if one of us made a typo on the second justifying pass, it had to be corrected with a single edge razor blade on a light table. Oh Lord, I still have scars. The bad word was cut out and replaced with a good word, then taped into place with white tape. Think jigsaw piece. One of my earliest memories of Carl at Artist was hearing him yell, shit, when he made a typo. <laughs> Which was rare, I might add. Uh, the volume of that exploit. You came later, Fred. You came later. This was the, the early days, yeah. The volume of that expletive was shocking coming from the usually cool, calm Carl. Soon it became funny and I started doing it too. It was just the background music that accompanied the process of quickly producing printed text. Uh, so we swore our way through thousands of lines of type and the books got done. Carl also taught me about debt financing in 1973. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you heard a little bit about the mortgage. Uh, me, Carl, I can't charge a trip to Russia on an American Express, an American Express card. I'll never be able to repay it. My credit rating will be ruined. Carl, well, Bill, would you rather go to Russia or stay at home and protect your credit rating? <laughs> <laughs> of course I picked go to Russia. <laughs> Only an idiot would pick stay home and protect my credit rating. <laughs> Naturally, the credit card was never paid. <laughs> and a few years later, Len Sharla, is he here? Yeah. <laughs> Our in-house attorney got Amex to stop harassing me. <laughs> you didn't know that. Uh, last, Carl showed me that it was possible to be self-employed. This was just major. My ability to project his cool demeanor on the telephone when talking to big city publishers about my typesetting company, company set me apart and got me over 80 publishers in four countries. Thousands of books later, I have to say, thank you, Carl. I could have not, not have done it without you. That's all. Yeah, I do feel that all of us had uh, went on to what could only be called Carl created and influenced careers. Um, I think that's something we all have in common here. And next up is Nancy. Beardsley, then Nancy Beveridge, who um, was my mentor, actually, uh, <laughs> when I got there. <laughs> well, I joined Bill in the engine room in 1973, except at that point it wasn't an engine room, it was a dining room table uh, in the Proffers town home. I'm still not quite sure why I got the job. I think I was one of the first, but certainly not the last students who were recipients of Carl and Ellen Day's great generosity, which extended not only towards Russians, but towards graduate students like me. Your dissertation on that's why you got the job. No, because that was a little later, actually. Well, Ellen Day and I have, I, I did write my dissertation on the possessed, which <laughs> was very fitting. But uh, <laughs> I, I met Carl first in a graduate seminar on satire, but I always felt that my real association with artists began on March 17, 1973. And some of you may remember that on that day, uh, there was a record snowfall in artists. More than a foot of snow was dropped on um, 
in Ann Arbor. And Carl and Ellen Dea had planned a St. Patrick's Day party for that day, an open party for the department. And I think it was Betsy Munger, who's here today also, a graduate student in history, and I had planned to go to the party, but we thought, do we really want to go through this snow? And then we decided, well, probably we should because no one else will go to their party and we don't want them to you know, go to all this trouble for nothing. So we got there, we walked in, the room was filled with people. It was an incredibly lively, happy party. People had walked long distances to get there. And for me, this would become really a kind of metaphor for everything else I experienced at Artists because it was this wildly improbable idea that turned into an extravagant success. And a few days later, Carl called and um, offered me a job at Artists. Uh, I think probably it was because we got to know each other better that night and they thought that we could all get along in the very close quarters that, that were artists at that point. This was, I like to say, not so much a job as a way of life at that point. Very quickly I learned to work proper hours which began late in the morning or maybe afternoon and went on well into the evening, sometimes all night long if um, we were um, finishing an issue of the Russian literature tri-quarterly. It was a place where everybody did everything. Uh, we all packed books, we all typed, we all did corrections, we all wrote dust jacket copy. Uh, and for a right, uh, graduate student, this was thrilling because I might one day be typing the poems of Joseph Brodsky, the next day driving him to his driver's examination. <laughs> uh, similarly, I might be taking yeah. Sasha Sokolov to an emergency dental appointment <laughs> or to hear his first bluegrass uh, music at the pretzel bell. Uh, we were really sort of helping these, these writers become a part of American life. And uh, conversely, any time a notable writer came to town, we were all included. We all went out to dinner. Uh, the proffers made everyone a part of everything, but it was a generosity so offhand and so nonchalant that it wasn't until years later that I realized uh, what I'd been offered. I uh, left artists in 1978 and went to Voice of America Radio, and as Fred says, I'm another person who owes my career to Carl. He set me up with um, some people there and I got the job. I took with me some lessons about writing that served me as well in broadcasting as they had at Artist. Carl had a wonderful writing style as several people noted yesterday. It was um, very engaging and, and informal and um, he really stressed to me how important it was to write in a simple way and I, he was also my thesis advisor. And I remember when I finished my dissertation, he said, well, there's way too many big words in it, but people are going to complain it's not scholarly enough, so just leave them in. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I did remember those lessons. And I wanted to close with a, a little story that happened years later that really summed up what artists meant for me. While I was at Voice of America, I had a chance to see Joseph Brodsky again again after he'd been named Poet Laureate and we did an interview and we took a little break in the middle of the interview and we started to reminisce about our days at Artists and he said, Nancy, do you feel as though Russia was some kind of, ha or, excuse me, Artist was some kind of happy childhood? And I realized that that's exactly what it was and it surprised me that Joseph Brodsky would feel the same way who had gone through so much before he ever came to Ann Arbor. But uh, we did all experience that happy childhood together. It was just full of fun and possibility and promise. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to have been part of it. I, I sort of feel like the outlier here because I uh, came to Carl from the library science department here instead of the Slavic department. And I was taking my library classes and was required to take some other classes. And I was looking through the catalog and saw uh, his uh, seminars on Gogol and the Bakov. And you had to go get permission from the instructor to take those classes if you weren't in the department. And it took me days to work up the nerve to go talk to this 
a person who was just in my mind a legend. And I went to his office and knocked on his door and told him I was from the library science department and he just looked at me with the strangest look of confusion <laughs> and said, I didn't, I didn't know those people got degrees. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I asked if I could take these classes and he seemed really confused by that but allowed me in and uh, there were only, I think, five other students in both of these classes, and I was the only one from out of the department. And we just had a blast. Um, some of these, especially the Nabokov novels, I had read over and over again as an undergraduate, so I came to him with a million questions. And he was just so incredibly generous with his time and expertise and everything. I just, I could not believe that I was there, uh, the whole time I was there. And I finally I just said, you know, I, is there anything I can do at Artis? I mean, I'll, I'll be the janitor. Just, you know. And so he let me come out and start packing books. And then when I got my degree, I was offered a job at the University of Detroit. And I just came to him and said, please don't let them take me alive. <laughs> and he said, just give me a day. And he gave me a full-time job there. And I started typesetting. And then pretty soon I started writing copy for the catalogs and the dust jackets and we had this just sort of amazing period. It was really a tremendously high energy time at Artists because we, I've started to use the uh, first person plural pronoun now after a few months there and um, uh, we started to do so much other stuff outside of RLT. It just seemed like the manuscripts were flying in and uh, we got the, of course, the Sasha Sokolov's School for Fools manuscript and Joseph picked that out of the slush pile and there's just this tremendous energy and excitement and we were doing all these really interesting scholarly works in English, the Gordon McVeigh biography of Yesenin and the Isadora and um, Yesenin book and it was just the intellectual ferment around there was just unbelievable. And then all these Russians were coming through and I was doing those same airport runs and uh, discovering, as Carl made it very clear, that all of these people were really human beings with, you know, foibles. And uh, he and Ellen Day would often refer to Dabakov as Volodya this and Volodya that. And it, it was really, you know, it was really eye-opening to <laughs> kind of to sort of be operating on this plane with these people that I would otherwise have regarded as deities. And um, it was really fun, too, to see the public persona of Carl and Ellen Dale, where Carl was always the sober, three-piece uh, suit, clad, scholarly gentleman, and Ellen Dale was the playful, mischievous, flamboyant partner. But inside artists, it was almost the other way around. You'd watch them collaborate on everything and you'd see this really playful side to Carl. I mean, he came to me one day when I hadn't even been there that long and said, uh, you know, my name is just on too many of these books, so I want you to be the editor of this um, uh, six, 10 bibliographies of 20th century Russian literature, which I couldn't even read since I had no Russian. <laughs> and uh, I was like, okay, <laughs> that works for me and it's still my best-selling title after, you know. um, but it was, he was so um, irreverent and so playful and so much fun to watch kind of working. I learned everything you could possibly learn about proper, clear, concise writing from him. I had the same experience Nancy had was, did you write this with a thesaurus in your left hand? I mean, it's just ridiculous. And the only time I ever saw him really get angry was at me for overwriting. And he really taught me that the purpose of writing is not to trick people and kind of befog them. It's to be really, really clear and concise. Uh, an invaluable lesson by, you know, just I can't even put into the properly few number of words what that uh, <laughs> meant to me. I can't remember where I was going with this, so I think what I'll do is go to Ron. <laughs> I met Carl and, Carl and Ellen Dea in the summer of 1980. I was soon to leave for Russia for a year. I had an IRIX grant, a research grant, to work on my dissertation about Nabokov, which I never wrote. Um, and Carl and Ellen Dea were always looking for channels for people to bring things to Russia. And there was a, a file uh, in the cabinet called precisely that, Channels. Um, I was introduced to them through David Lowe, 
who was one of the original editors of RLT, I think. Um, and we went up, I remember we went out for dinner. I remember being ama amazed that Arabella, who couldn't have been more than two then, was running around at midnight uh, with <laughs> after we got back from the restaurant. Um, we hit it off. They sent me all sorts of stuff for Ina Varlamova, the usual package of heart medicine that she couldn't get in the Soviet Union, clothes uh, and stuff for the Kopilevs, Tanya Loskotova, and so on. Um, and during my year at, in Moscow, I got to, to know these very important people in the, proffer's, in the proffer's life, as well as Emma Gerstein, who became a really good friend of mine. Um, and that's one thing that has been mentioned earlier. Um, the, the, Carl and Andrea would look at both sides of things. They didn't really like Emma. She was a difficult person. She was timid. She was nothing like Nadezhda Mandelstam. But still, they published her and, and would um, gratify my wish that you know we would do this and whatnot. Anyway, after after ten months in Moscow, I was supposed to have a job at Indiana. That fell through. I was broke. I moved to Ann Arbor after hanging out with Helena Gashilo in Pittsburgh, who also had connections with artists, and landed on David Lowe's doorstop because he was here for a month or so. And um, Carl, David had talked to Carl and Ellen Dea, obviously, couldn't they use somebody, blah, blah, blah. And I spent a good six weeks at that famous light table. Um, <laughs> Uh, after which um, I was taken on, on permanently and allowed to move away from the light table now and then. <laughs> um, uh, Marisha Staffan, I should say, was, was there when I arrived and, and she would help. But I was really confined to the light table. <laughs> Everyone else was working on uh, Rudnitsky's translation of Meyerhold, the director. I was incredibly envious because I was doing really very tedious work on a very tedious book. I won't mention the title. Uh, no, yes, Marisha was stuck with the invoicing, but she got to do more editorial work then, too. Um, beginning in 1982, Carl and Elodea weren't allowed, weren't given visas to go back to the Soviet Union. Okay, and well, I, I, but beginning in 1982, I would go as as the artist representative, um, and also to, I, I think it was to keep me happy and uh, as a bonus, but um, but also to have to meet with writers to, to say that you know artist is continuing, to um, bring things there to mail things back out through the embassy. Um, it was a lot of fun, packed into a 10-day general tour, Moscow and Leningrad. Um, and I got to meet incredible people, and you know, still I'm in touch with a lot of them today. But I mean, people that I would have to see no, on a normal basis would be Bitev Iskander, of course, Gerstein. Um, later it was Makan and Kurayev, Olga Trifonova, uh, many of the people that would come to the celebration of artists' 25th anniversary uh, in 96 at the Foreign Library. Um, I too owe my, my career to Carl and Elendea. As I mentioned, I never wrote my dissertation on Boonin. I was given word that I had to finish my dissertation within six months. Carl and Ellen said, you're never going to write this thing on Boone and Beatif, take Beatif. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote my dissertation very quickly um, on Pushkin House, uh, but I was only able to do that because they gave me a month uh, paid leave and then I think another month or even more working half time so that I could finish it. Uh, and I'll wind this up too, but as the other aspect that has come up a lot is it was a very family operation, especially after Carl got ill. He and Ellen Dea were away a lot. I was with Arabella a lot. And, and I wrote the conclusion to my dissertation with Arabella on my knee in front of 
Carl's electric typewriter because she had the flu or something. So she was coughing and not sleeping, and I was trying to come up with something that I could FedEx the next day. So thanks. <laughs> Off like this. Okay, so um, I worked for artists from 1982 until the very end, I guess in, into the late 1990s, or yes. Um, so it was a long time, and most of the time I worked for artists, it was run by Ellen Dea. But I first met uh, Carl and Ellen Dea at the same time in 1971, which um, my husband and I were invited to a party to celebrate the first issue of Russian Literature Tri-Quarterly. And so I met the young Ellen Dea and the young Carl, who were, you know, incredibly energetic and very enthusiastic. And, and there was that beautiful first issue of Russian Literature Tri-Quarterly, which people have described as being, you know, it was something very new then. It wasn't academic, and there was all this Russian literature in it, and photographs, and the humor section, which Jerry talked about. So it was fun, you know, it wasn't boring and academic. <laughs> so, um, you know, I liked it a lot, and I started looking at, you know, Russian literature like tri quarterly, but I was not. Um, you know, I was busy with other things at the time, like three children, so uh, I only a couple of years later did I go to graduate school and start studying Russian literature, and because Carl's hours did not coincide with my hours, um, I never took a course from him, which was sad. One time I signed up for the GoGo -Go course at one o'clock only to find out that it um, had been changed to four o'clock, so <laughs> I, had to, I had to drop it. Anyway, um, but I really relied on artist books as a student, and I think uh, everyone who was a student at that time did, uh, because not only was it the main source of information about contemporary Russian literature, but um, for the 20th century literature, which Carl did not teach in those years, uh, it just provided um, so much more information than I got in the Russian survey course, which follow, I think was very traditional at that time because it was Russian literature until 1917 and then it became Soviet literature and all of the emigres disappeared. We never heard about them again. So we read a few poems by Marina Tsvetaeva in her early years, and um, that was the end. She disappeared, so we never read any of her best work. Um, needless to say, Nabokov was not mentioned. And um, I, I found out so much m more from the artist catalogs and artist books and RLT. Um, I first heard of Platana, for example, from RLT. I had no idea who he was. Anyway, so, um, so I, w I did my um, four years of graduate student study, and then in 1982, I was working for Michigan Slavic Publications um, with Ladislav Mateka, who was then professor of uh, uh, Slavic uh, linguistics, and he ran Michigan Slavic publications and also was about to start the journal Cross Currents. Uh, and he's not here anymore. He died last year, but I, I really think he must have been influenced a lot by what artists did because what he did was to start a journal um, that would print Eastern European literature that was banned, and so for 10 years that ran, and so I have to say that Ann Arbor was not only the center for um, Russian literature at that time, but it was also a center of, uh, for Eastern European literature. It was very good, a center for um, publishing things that couldn't be published there, so actually Ann Arbor had the whole Soviet bloc covered. <laughs> And then um, in 1982, I, when I was working there, I, was, um, I heard the terrible news that we all heard from the secretary of the Slavic department that Carl had been diagnosed with a cancer, which we heard was inoperable. So it was you know, just a terrible shock for everyone. And a few weeks later, Ellen Dare called me to say that um, they had found someone who would operate and that they needed more help at artists and would I like to come and work for artists instead of Michigan Slavic publications. She would give me more money, she said. <laughs> but I probably would have taken it anyway, so um, you could have saved some money. <laughs> so I did, and that's how I started. And um, obviously those were very hard times uh, for 
for artists because of Carl's cancer. Um, but, you know, Carl and Ellen Dare were so brave about it and they were so strong that I never, you know, felt that there was any, you know, hesitation about running artists. It seemed to run the same way that it had always run. Um, Ron was there when I came and Marisha was there and shortly after Rachel came. So, um, well, I started out doing typesetting and Ron moved up to other things. <laughs> Yes, I have to catalog. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I did a lot of typesetting, but in the, and so in those years, um, the two years I had working with Carl before he died, uh, he was you know he was just so practical and he didn't waste time, and I, it's just so brave of him to have gone through that without you know making us feel that he was suffering. <laughs> But sometimes I would come in early in the morning and he would be sitting at the Russian composer and he would have had trouble sleeping and he would not be wasting time. He would be typing away um, with a Russian shawl over his shoulders because it was cold in the front room. And he saw that certain projects he really wanted to have done were done at that time. For example, I know he really wanted Ellen Day's book on Bogakov to come out and it did before he died. And then um, after he died, Ellen Dayas took over and, and ran things. And, um, you know, I worked with her for years. And we were both born in November, so we called each other Sister Sag. And we, um, you know, the artists became really a family for me, too. So even though I had another family, and they were sometimes very jealous that I spent so much time at artists. Um, I wanted to talk about the Moscow Book Fair in 1987 because that was the first time I went to Russia with artists and that was an incredible time because Glasnost had just started and it was the first time artists was allowed to go since, um, what, 10 years, 77, so it had been 10 years. Um, so Ron went and Arabella, who was nine years old, went and Ellen Day and so we didn't know quite what to expect because it was a sort of a step forward, a step back the whole time. When we first got there, Ellen Dea and Arabella were held up because she was still blacklisted. Ron, Ron and I went through. So that was a bad sign. But the next day when we got to the exhibition hall, um, Ellen Dea went to sign us in and the, a young man said, are you Ellen Dea Proffer? And she said yes, and so he said, just a minute. And I was thinking, oh no, it's going to be something else. And he reached under the table and brought out a book, and it was a copy of the first volume of Bogakov's um, Sobrania Sachininia, which artists had published, and he was asking for her autograph. So that was a great sign. And then we, we went into the um, exhibition hall only to find out that none of our books were there. Um, and so they were, 50 books were taken from the censors and they returned 30 of them. So that became a very major scandal in those days that they had taken 20 of our books. I think the only other book that was censored at that fair was Mein Kampf. <laughs> and they, we never got them back. So. Um, Ellen Deer, you know, very bravely stuck up, stood up for artists and all of the American publishers. It became a big scandal. It was in the newspapers. Um, I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> Washington Post, as well as the New York Times, as well as the Soviet papers. And we never got them back. But um, <laughs> uh, that was just, it was an incredible book fair for me because it was the first time I saw the Russian readers and met a, a lot of the writers. And that was the most moving thing because we had a very small stand and people were lined up from all the way down the stairs, around the block, you know, around the corner, and they waited for hours to get into our stand because there was only enough room for 15 or 20 people at a time. Arabella was then, what, you were seven years old? Nine years old, and she helped us stay on guard, I remember, <laughs> for hours. So um, it was just very moving to see people come in who had waited for hours, and they saw the books, and they cried, and they thanked us. And uh, that was, uh, you know, just a really memorable experience. And two years later, we went back to the book fair. Things had changed completely. Um, no books were taken away. And uh, it was a different world, and so artists really had fulfilled its mission. 
And then um, there was the fall of the Soviet Union. So I, I, at that time, my husband and I moved east, and, but there were also great advances in printing so, and, and the internet and everything else. So I continued to work for artists for a number of years from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where we lived. And um, let's see, what else did I want to say? I don't know. Um, hmm, there was something else and I forgot. Oh, well, we did a lot of books, different books in the 90s because, um, you know, Glasnost was, had taken care of a lot of things and our books could be published in Russia in the, by that time. So we did more English books. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and, um, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, no, what well, I had to do the final thing, which is that... Um, Ellen Dea then moved to the West Coast, and we were on the East Coast, and you know we were. Time went by, and an artist was finally sold, and so Ellen Dea and I were not as quite as much in touch then as we used to be. When all of a sudden one day, our son Ben went to, decided to go visit California, and um, <laughs> he reunited with Arabella Proffer, who had. <laughs> who had been a small girl. Ben used to work for a while. All of our kids worked for at some time, or two of them at, in the packing room at Artists when they were growing up. But before we knew it, um, Ben and Arabella were a team, and they still are, so, and they're here today. <laughs> so, okay. How many seconds are left? Oh, there's just plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares. Yeah. Okay, so ac according to Alexei Tsvitkov, I represent the animal kingdom. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, good. Okay. Um, what? Crossover. A crossover, yeah. Well. Um, there's a bit of a background story. Uh, I emigrated uh, from the Soviet Union. Uh, our first stop was Boston. And shortly after, my husband uh, got a job offer in Detroit. And everything we heard about Detroit was really scary. And uh, we decided to settle in Ann Arbor. And Ann Arbor was known for its safety, its cultural diversity, its good schools, and of course, artists. And like uh, Alexei said, I mean, we knew very little about the West, understood even less, but we all knew about artists, and it had a very, very special sacred part uh, in our hearts. We chased some as that. Uh, we considered ourselves fortunate when we laid our hands on, you know, that rare copy of uh, the book published by artists. We read through the night. And um, artists together uh, with the Vraj Yigalasa, the enemy voices of the Voice of America and Radio Liberty, um, they were literally our lifelines, and um, and we grew up uh, in a very atheist uh, society, but we had our religion, and that was literature, and poets were our prophets, and we did make our idols, and the prophets were on top of the list, and. Uh, it, Artist was truly like Olympus. And uh, when uh, we were uh, about to move away, uh, to move from Boston, and it was, you know, like getting uprooted again, and oh my God, what will I do there? Uh, another unknown universe. The, my friends were kind of joking, and they say, oh, you're going to Artist, you can always work. Uh, you're going to Ann Arbor, you can always work at Artist. And that was not funny at all. It was very annoying to me, not an, an amusing, because again, it was like, you know, for a mortal to get even close to that unattainable place. So I don't, I don't, I don't remember how long it took me to work up my confidence a really long time and how many tries it took me to actually finish dialing the 
Crawford's number without hanging up. Um, but I finally did, and Carl picked up the phone, and he set up a time for me to come. And I don't remember a thing. I don't remember anything. He said, I said, it was all a blur. But I had a job, and so I started uh, coming to artists. And uh, though still in a haze, um, those memories are very vivid, and they are kind of etched in my memory. And that these are memories of an animal, you know, and a recent emigre getting to this science fictional country. And so artist was like like fantasy to me. It was like Disney. Um, the house was huge, and it was uh, sitting on a former um, golf course. And the fact that that holy act was happening uh, in the basement did not diminish my awe one bit. And uh, I remember animals owning the place, like okay, the cats and Pushkin, who was named not after Alexander Sergeyevich, but uh, after Musin Pushkin, because I guess he was white. I never checked with you. <laughs> <laughs> The so, so, so. Oh, I, 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 th I <laughs> because I thought it was the color because he was white. So, and and I uh, remember this little princess Arabella who would come downstairs with her crayons, and she had a very capitalist touch. She was very entrepreneurial. She would finish her fantasy drawings and then she would try to sell them to us. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember um, seeing Ron and Marianne and Marisha, and they looked very normal, amazingly, and friendly, and they were eating Entenmann cake with coffee. <laughs> and every time, even now, when I see Entenmann cake, I have this fuzzy feeling, you know, so it will... Um, and... Uh, Late in the afternoon, the royal couple would descend. <laughs> and that would happen after one o'clock. Uh, and Elendea looked regal and tall and beautiful. And Carl looked handsome and tall. And he had this quiet dignity of a noble man. And he was holding on to his operated side. He was already, uh, um, yeah, he was already sick. And um, I remember uh, my conversations with Carl. He was very straightforward about his uh, disease, about the diagnosis, the prognosis. Uh, he uh, talked how. Um, he gave himself up like a guinea pig, uh, you know, because he wanted to buy time to make sure that Arabella remembers him, that Arabella is old enough to remember him. And um, though very ill already, he, um, and coming downstairs uh, more and more rarely, I, I remember that he was very much involved in all the projects. Um, he was very excited about Sasha Sokolov's uh, Shkola de Durakov, and that was the first uh, book he gave me. Uh, uh, and, you know, I read that. We discussed uh, the Nabokov's translations, um, new manuscripts that he asked me to read. Um, he was uh, he was very gracious. Um, he would come to my uh, first house uh, warming party and uh, f feeling bad, but he, looking for a quiet corner. But he would, you know, he would still uh, come. I remember him taking Alandea to dinner 
because my uh, oldest son would babysit Arabella. He was a few years older. So um, uh, it was like for everybody, you know, uh, with Carl so gravely ill and Russian literature not being exactly a very happy and optimistic subject to be working with, uh, there was this sense of normalcy still about our lives. I remember Ellen Day and Mary and Anne, I was very jealous they would take off in the middle of the day and go to a swimming pool. Um, Ellen Day would teach me a few uh, lessons in makeup application. You know, the girls would go to a Detroit mall uh, to be in style for the next party because artists was big on uh, parties. Um, totally unrelated, I'm not even sure I can disclose this to Russian literature, but uh, as, as a kind of a ob obligatory initiation to the artist class, I had to go and see the psychic, <laughs> <laughs> Madam Florida, and, uh, El <laughs> and Ellen Day uh, insisted on driving me there and waiting for me and driving me back uh, in case I got shaky after those cathar <laughs> cathartic revelations, which I was, and I was very thankful for that. Um, <laughs> You know, there were very few of us <laughs> there, and we were young and very dedicated and hard uh, working. And um, but uh, it, it, I never, um, I never looked at artists as a job. It was an honor and a privilege. And ironically enough, you know, I found myself reading through the night again all those manuscripts and all the books that, um, you know, that were banned in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union. And, um, uh, you know, all the idols and heroes of my uh, youth were suddenly there in flesh and blood and I got to talk to them and I got to work to them and I got uh, uh, to, you know, the, 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 the rewards, the, the projects. I, I think I was actually much luckier than you though. The, the translations made money and maybe the, the Russian books didn't make uh, that much money but the, the, uh, the projects I was working on. It's, oh my God, totally unbelievable, you know, and, and Nabokov and, and, um, and Brodsky. I, I, I actually got to work with Brodsky. I uh, went to Greenwich and uh, where there we worked on uh, his Urania. I worked with Yelena Sikorskaya on uh, her book on the uh, correspondence with uh, Nabokov. So it's 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 surreal. It's unbelievable. And uh, you know, to, to to come to artists and to chat to Joseph Brodsky while he was sipping coffee while he was staying uh, with Ellen Day and Carl was totally surreal. So I don't know what else. Mm -hmm. Our acquaintance with Carl and Ellen Day began, it seems to me, in, in uh, 1969. My husband, Leonie Chertkov, wrote article on Vladimir Nabokov in the short literary encyclopedia. The volume was published in uh, 1968 in Moscow. Karl's book on Nabokov, Keys to Lalita, was published in the 1968 too. Karl read Lodi's article, the first one maybe in the USSR on Nabokov, and wanted to, to meet with Lodi. 
At the same time, Carl knew that Leone was a dissident who spent uh, uh, during five years in the labor uh, camp in Mordovia. When Carl and Elle arrived to Moscow, they visited Nadezhda Yakelna Mandelstam and advised, uh, and advised with her. Nadezhda Yakelna Mandelstam thought that the meeting um, could be dangerous for Leone. Then Carl and Elinde arrived to Leningrad and uh, visited Josef Brodsky. Josef knew Leonia for a long time and told that Leonia would be glad to see Carl. So Josef invited us to his place. Leonia had a talk with Carl, I met with Elinde and we became friends. After first meeting, Elinde and Carl came to see us uh, very often when they um, arrived uh, uh, to uh, our city. And uh, um, often we met uh, together with uh, our mutual friends, uh, such as uh, Romas and Elia Katilius, uh, Gena Shmakov, Gary Clevington, Sofia Polikova, um, Era Korbova, and so on. But uh, when uh, uh, Carl and Ellen Day arrived in Leningrad, uh, it was famous in a minute. And uh, uh, a lot of people People wanted to come to my place and meet with him. But uh, there were some people, I don't uh, <laughs> tell you their names, which Ellen Day didn't like at all. And uh, she <laughs> told me, Tanya, I come to your place if this man or this woman don't come. <laughs> and it was very complex uh, stories <laughs> when the people wanted to come. No, not today, maybe tomorrow. And they come <laughs> and they told, Tanya, I told you, not invite. I don't invite it. But they came, I can't <laughs> close the door. What can I do? <laughs> and they know what, <laughs> knows what I mean. Um, <clears throat> um, and uh, um, uh, Carl and Ellen Day presented us with new books which were published in, Ardi uh, in Ardis. Uh, it can be a, a reprinted uh, uh, edition of uh, Mikhail Bulgakov earlier short stories or Andrei Sobol short stories uh, or something new such as uh, Sasha Sokolov or maybe new volume of uh, Russian literary uh, three quarterly. Uh, he, uh, uh, Carl and Ellen Day could choose and published something unusual. Once I read uh, an article on Nikolai Yevrenov, which wrote research from the South Africa. The other time it was a uh, diary's uh, note uh, on Krushonich by uh, Gordon McVeigh. Leonie and I took part in the artist publications. Uh, the last novel by Konstantin Wagenov, Garpaganiada, was first time published in Ardis. My article on uh, Russian writers in Georgia in 1970-1921 was published in the Ardis anthology of Russian Futurism. Uh, uh, once we celebrated uh, New Year together, it was 1971, uh, if and uh, uh, we were at uh, Josef Brodsky uh, place with Thomas Svenslova, his wife Era Korobova, and Andrei Sergeyev. Uh, and the next day we were at uh, um, our friends uh, Romas and Elie Katilius. It was a famous day because um, death sentence uh, to Eduard Kuznetsov was uh, um, commuted. And uh, all of us were very, uh, were very glad. And uh, as I remember, uh, uh, Roma told, I uh, tell you uh, bad uh, poem, but uh, good poem. С Новым годом, с Новым счастьем и с отменой смертной казни. И... At the same evening, uh, I remember when we were at Katilius' place, Ellen Day had a uh, weak, very uh, long uh, uh, hairs. <laughs> Uh, it was a very uh, handsome <laughs> week, and all of us uh, tried it on. <laughs> it was very interesting, especially uh, as it seems to me, Iosif with this week uh, was like a uh, lord <laughs> in parliament, in old parliament. <laughs> uh, and um, 
in uh, um, the spring of 1972, um, Karl arrived, uh, as it famous before, uh, Iosif uh, uh, departure uh, to West. And uh, this time, Iosif uh, presented us, uh, Karl presented us uh, some copies of uh, Iosif poems from Trickwaterly, with very good uh, photo uh, of Iosif. And uh, uh, one of this copy where we sent to Tashkent, uh, our friend in Tashkent asked uh, the other copy um, to Sukhumi, to my Georgian friend, poet Rene Kalandi, who was very proud to get Iosif poems with a good photo of his favorite uh, poems. All over the Soviet Union, these copies <laughs> uh, sent. And uh, uh, <clears throat> at the same time, um, at this time, I wanted to emigrate, but my husband was uh, uh, against of it. And when I said goodbye uh, to uh, Karl, um, he um, whispered, persuade him. Uh, two years later, in 1938, uh, my husband Leonie emigrated, and uh, Karl invited him to work uh, in Ardis. But Leonie refused. He wanted to stay, uh, decided to stay in Europe. Um, for a long time, uh, Professor and I sent uh, letters uh, each other and uh, discussed uh, um, latest news in literature. And uh, uh, last uh, story, uh, funny story, somebody from Ardis uh, presented me with T-shirt. Uh, the title of the T-shirt was Russian, Liter Russian literature is better than sex. And uh, <laughs> uh, it was... Uh, <laughs> left Tolstoy hat and couple of youths on his head. And I like to go to famous uh, professors uh, in a uh, court, and at the court was this T-shirt. <laughs> uh, hello, hello. I <laughs> took out coat and didn't uh, uh, tell anything about my T-shirt. Uh, how are you? Uh, what are you doing? What, uh, uh, what do you write now? And uh, uh, the professor, one or another, the third, uh, looked at this and uh, thought, thought uh, and one linguist uh, told, um, are you sure? <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, the other one told me, I don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at the end, I presented uh, this t-shirt to one of my friend, avant-gardist, who lived in uh, town Yeysk. Sergei Sigei, and he wears this t-shirt, but uh, it uh, uh, was dangerous in little town Yeysk, because some of people decided that it isn't good, uh, according to Lev Tolstoy. <laughs> and so I don't know where is this t-shirt now. <laughs> <laughs> Someone stole this T-shirt from me, and but I still have a post on my wall. Well, on the wall. There are no posters left. Yeah, this is a bibliography. I have a poster. Have a post. Ellen Day, I still have one, and I used to put it on my door, and I almost got fired for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting truer and truer over the years. I, I am now concluding my moderator duties. <laughs> Good job. Thank you so much for the roundtable participants made us laugh, made, made us think, and I really appreciate and thank you for your uh, invaluable in input into our. <laughs>